Hello, and welcome back to Fusion Writing, where building character meets creating structure. We are in our exciting third week of the month, where we're talking about the Zettelkasten, a wonderful mechanism by which you can offload some of your information about your characters in your story in such a way that you can retrieve it quickly, but you don't have to have it all piled in your brain. It's so handy to have some of it available where you can reach it whenever you need it. And today is the, the map day where we're going to go a little bit deeper into how we actually do some of this. And today we're going to be talking about a little bit about our heroes and our villains and where they show up in our Zettelkasten. So take it away, Victoria. Hello. So you may recall from yesterday, we took a high level view over interconnecting your good guys and your bad guys, weaving those into a compelling story, making sure that you land on a satisfying resolution for your reader, and ultimately keeping track of all of that stuff for yourself because you can't hold it all in your head. That's where the Zettelkasten as a tool is priceless because it becomes the receptacle by which not only are you saving and cataloging all of your information, but you're indexing it so that you can always find those pieces again and go back down that breadcrumb trail, often making new discoveries and connections along the way. That's where the really cool magic happens. But we'll talk about that later. Today, I want to relate it specifically to good guys versus bad guys. So as some of you may know, my novel section in my Zettelkasten is the 7,000s for book one. So I'm not going to get too far into the weeds in numbering because your numbering system is your own. And Kathleen will talk a little bit about that. The important thing to realize and remember is you always want to be relating your characters to each other. That happens in your index. So let's take a quick look at how this works for a couple of my main characters. On this card, which happens to be 7121.5, you don't care about that. You care about the information. This is information about one of my, my main male lead character. What's important, however, is what's on the back. This is a little sketch that I did that shows you the library, his conservatory. In this room, many of the important things that happen in the story take place. So in terms of capturing that information, it's not just writing words on cards or capturing quotes or writing down bits of dialogue as they come to you. It's also about creating and remembering the environments that you're writing so that 400 pages from now, when you're trying to remember to yourself, okay, if I'm looking at Marshall Branch's office, do the chairs face his desk or do they face the window? If that detail is important, you're going to need a sketch. So I've sketched out the room. I've also made a few details on the other side of the card about the scene where I first described this room. That way I can get back draft or you can just catalog it using your Zettelkasten numbers and you're going to install that over in your Zettelkasten after you record it in your index. So I might label this in my index as branches office under B for branch, right? Because that's alphabetized. I might then go to D for Diamond B Ranch, which is the name of the ranch where he lives and make myself a note, Diamond B Ranch equals branches office and put that number there as well. And then I might even go to C under chapter five and make myself a note that in chapter five, I refer to the layout of his office. Are you starting to see how those things interrelate and you use your index in order to navigate around? So then let's look at that from the other side, which is I have a very similar layout that I've created for my bad guy's office. Now his isn't as detailed as branches because we don't spend a lot of time there, but I do make reference to the curtains and the carpet. So that information is tucked away on my main bad guy's card. Now let's look at how those interrelate. We're going to change our focus from looking at their environment to looking at their character. Kathleen's going to address a high-level view of some of the major character trait groups, so I won't touch on that, but I do want to talk about how you relate them together. 
maybe in the environment, your good guy, your protagonist environment is lightly colored, right? Light carpet, light drapes, bright room, cheery feeling. Maybe your bad guy's environment is a dark environment. See the counterpoint? Now that's kind of a cliched one, but it makes the point. You can use something as obvious as their environments to counterpoint them against each other as two sides of the same story coin. Now let's look at something like, let's say, loyalty. Maybe your good guy has loyalty as one of his guiding character traits. Well, then you can counterpoint your bad guy with all kinds of cool things that counterpoint loyalty. So start thinking about how can I play them off of each other in their mannerisms, their dress, their environment. There's all kinds of stuff that you're going to record on your character cards that get installed over in your note box, your Zettelkasten, that you can then refer back to when you need either to remember and describe a detail over again, or you need to describe them as a counterpoint to each other. One of the cards that I have under my villain, I've made the note, the key to the villain is power seeks power. It's just a simple note to myself. But it's a reminder to me when I'm looking at how my main good guy and my main bad guy interrelate, power seeks power. So as I'm writing them, I need to be sure that that dynamic is at play so that my reader keys in to the fact that my good guy, my main guy is a powerful, developed character and my villain is as well. And therein lies a point of connection but also a point of conflict. So I'm going to leave you there because that's a lot of information to take in. But my final piece of advice as you're developing these things is ask yourself questions. Now, I've covered the key part of this question up because there's no spoilers. I'm not going to tell you that. But this just says, what if T discovers X? And it says, how does she learn this? This is a card in relation to something about my bad guys. So on my bad guys card, I'm going to answer those questions. And then in my numbering, I'm going to make sure that in my index, I reference between those two so that one reference points to the other and back again. That way, when I'm thinking about how does she discover that key fact, how does she learn it? What is important about it? I can go between those two character cards and retrace my steps for how I thought of it, why it is significant, and how I want to write it into the story. So those are just a few high-level looks at how you're digging into those characters, you're using your cards to develop how they relate, how they counterpoint, conflict, etc., and then writing through how you're going to bring them together in the story, reflect them as mirrors of each other in the story, and ultimately get them to that final conflict and the resolution that you hope your good guy wins. So with all of that said, get busy writing, start thinking about how does the light and dark, the good guy and the bad guy, protagonist and villain, how do they mirror and relate to one another based on their traits? in every aspect from environment to personality and onward? And then how can you effectively write those connections in so that you've got good story and also record those in your index using your cards so that you can get back to them and remember your thought train. So I'm gonna hand it over to my esteemed colleague, Kathleen, to pick up for the rest of the, the video. Oh, right. Thank you so much, Victoria. You give me so much excitement ready for my writing and I just love hearing your take on these things. Wow. Well, I'm going to cover two different independent topics. One of them talks a little bit about the structure of your Zettelkasten because if you're going to be making these cards and you're going to be putting something in your index, well, it's nice to say, well, it's up to you what numbers are you going to put down, but you got to put down a number. So what are you going to use? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to go back to the what I consider the great fun part, which is talking about counterbalancing character traits in the four main groups that we've covered so far. So let's take a 
look at the numbers first. The simplest way to deal with numbers, as I mentioned once before, if you saw my very first map video on the Zellicaston, the numbers that you start with, that four digit prefix is just your geography. Do you want your cards near the front of the box or do you want your cards near the back of the box? Now, Victoria started out with a set of numbers, card numbers that was given to her by the author of a very well-known book that both of us read and both of us used to get started with our Zellicaston. It's the Internet Zellicaston by Scott P. Shepper. He's the number one guy in the world for understanding physical Zellicastons where you put your stuff on a card. He has more knowledge than anyone on planet Earth. He's my guru and he's Victoria's guru too. However, this happens to be only 500 and some pages. So, you know, read it in a weekend. And, you know, I'll see you, Monday, see you next Monday. Well, that's not going to happen. But the good news is that the actual card numbering part is super easy. And I'm going to get you started with something with right now. I'm going to ask you to write the numbers from 1,000 to 7,000 on a file card. 1,000 dash, 2,000 dash, that's your it lists to yourself of what your numbers mean. So you might, I'm going to give you one example to get you started, which is the example that Mr. Scott P. Shepard happens to recommend. And that is, Victoria used it also, that 1,000 is arts and humanities. Okay, so if your 1,000 is arts and humanities, you get to break it down from there. How are you going to break it down? Well, I'll give you a hint. Victoria has one that we saw last time that we went into Zettelkasten. She has an area called 1100, which she calls Zettelkasten for fiction. You might want to use that area, but it's up to you what you're going to use for each of hers. She's mentioned that she uses that 7000 area for her first, the first book of her trilogy of novels. You might want to copy that. I tend to use the 5,000s for my projects, but that's totally up to you. And pardon me, the 4,000s for my projects, but that's totally up to you. You see, you have to come up with your own numbering system. Everybody does. And I, my suggestion is, as you need a set of numbers, give them names. Until you need them, don't bother naming them. And once you need a new group, give it a name. But then if you need another subgroup, name the subgroup that you need. Pick one, pick a number. Don't You don't have to flesh the whole thing out from the start. You don't have to have any idea where you're going with the numbers. Just get, just use them, define them as you need them. And just like with the character traits, you want to offload things and not keep everything in your brain. We'll keep cards where you keep track of what you, what numbers meant, because you got to say what they mean. And if you want to get started, there's two numbers you can start with, 1,000 and 1,100. The rest is totally up to you. So that's all I'm going to go with for you on the numbers right now. Oh, and what happens after the number? That's, again, completely up to you. Very common would be to like use a dot and then start numbering the cards. And you can do dot one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and just start counting. That's a simple way of doing things. And there's nothing wrong with that. We'll get, we'll talk a little bit more as the weeks go by of, you know, some tricks and some choices. Now for the fun part, we've talked about four character trait groups so far. And these, each of these character trait groups have subgroups and then individual character traits within them. The excitement is really at the individual character trait level. We can start working with them because just from the names of the groups, you know enough about the meaning of those words that you can probably come up with some, some of the character traits to play with. So take, for instance, we talked it during the compass session about insight and how you can play off the good guy and the bad guy because the, the bad guy will think he's ever so brilliant, but he'll, he'll have blind spots. And those blind spots can be the virtues of your hero. Well, let's take a look at other aspects 
Like take, for instance, resilience. Resilience is your character's fight against the physical world, against things that are hard, not interpersonal relationships, but just the toughness of life, battling illness, battling difficult physical things that have to happen, um, passing a test, just things that are hard, hard, hard to do. Well, your villain is likely to be ready to take shortcuts. He thinks he's already so powerful and so strong. He doesn't need to increase his strength. He doesn't need to test himself. He just is. But your, your good guy is often feels his lack, feels that he, he's deficient in some ways and has to challenge himself. But the real way in which the, the good guy can surprise the villain is in heroic resilience when he'll go out of his way for someone else, when he'll climb up that hill for someone else, when he'll slug through the mud to save someone else, when he'll run into a burning building to rescue a child. Those are the ways that the villain cannot comprehend because the villain cannot see past the blinders that are his himself. And that's always a good plan. So now you have two examples. You have an example of insight and you have an example of resilience. There's two more to play with. Balance, the character's moderation, his ability to live comfortably within himself. And empathy, the biggest group of all, how the character relates with others. All right, now it's on you to come up with some examples of interplay between the villain and the good guy. Try him out. We have three more days. We have, this is Tuesday. We have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We meet over in Lily Pub and we chat about it in the chat on lilypub.org. And if you belong to Lily Pub, you can go into the chat in the Fusion Writing Group and talk about your good guy and your bad guy and how they are behaving in a counterpoint. You can share with one another the numbering system that you've decided. And you can say, what do you think, guys? Do you think this numbering system will work? What are you going to do? You can chat about it over in Lily Pub in the, in the comment sections and get a discussion going. And on Saturday, check out the events tab because on Saturday, we get together in a Zoom call and we talk face to face. We share writing that we've done and we just have a, a wonderful time talking about all of these concepts in a roundtable discussion live. So be sure to hop on over to Lily Pub for and you won't want to miss out on that last part, that whole rest of the week. This is just Monday, Tuesday. We have a whole wonderful week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the big Zoom call on Saturday. So pop on over to Lily Pub. Okay. And what would you like to say to close us, Victoria? Oh, that was amazing. I love, I love listening to the way that you break the character groups apart at a high level because it, even I, as I sit and listen I get great ideas and I I start to think oh yeah that could work or this could work so for me that is the the huge value of fusion writing and our group as a tool because each of us brings such different perspectives and skill sets that when we all get together and start talking about this stuff inevitably either one of the writing challenges that we issue over there for each other or the discussions give me not only um, energy and, and drive to get back into that story and get the writing done, but also just getting up on that balance beam and going through the acrobatics of, can I get this story off the ground and make it work? It's, it's just super exciting. And, and the way that we all lift each other up and support each other's processes is so valuable to me. So I, I just love listening to you talk about this stuff. I could just listen all day long. So yes, get your pens on the paper, start experimenting with how can I take my good guy and give him a hole and my bad guy and give him a hole. And then how are they gonna poke each other in those wounds so that I can relate their struggles together and then ultimately write a great story. Just get those words on the page and start experimenting and then get over to lilypub.org and join us. The whole reason that we're here is to help you. 
We want to bring you into the club, make you one of the cool kids alongside all of us, and help you write the very best stories and works that you can. Short stories, fiction, nonfiction, nothing is off the table. Everyone over there writes different things and everyone is welcome. We're just focusing on fiction because that's where we are right now. So please come and join us, get involved and, and be part of the sharing because ultimately that's the best part. So we look forward to seeing you over there. Okay, thank you so much, Victoria. And we will see you on in YouTube land next Monday for our writing session, which is always so much fun. So that's all here on YouTube for the week. But we'll see you over in Lily Pub. Bye bye. Thank you.